In this episode of Detroit Performs, an intuition-based painter, sculptor, and photographer. An artist combs the streets of Detroit and comes up with a breathtaking photo series. And Florida's unique ecosystem is captured in pictures. It's all ahead on this edition of Detroit Performs. Funding for Detroit Performs is provided by the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs, MGM Grand Detroit, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, I'm DJ Oliver and welcome to Detroit Performs. I'm at the Interstate Gallery located in Detroit's Eastern Market. In today's episode, we're featuring photography and how every photograph has a story behind it. From gorgeous landscapes taken from a fast moving car to the beauty in the face of a stranger on the street. Our first artist is Diane Marie Kramer, whose past experiences can be seen throughout her work as she adds meaningful trinkets and baubles to her paintings and sculptures. Plus, she's found a positive spin on the term drive-by shooting with her camera as the shooter. Let's take a look. I'm a painter and a sculptor and a photographer and most of my work at this phase in my life is intuitive based. Years back, um, when I was just a little girl, my father would um, come home um, on a Friday and he would dump an entire dump truck full of dirt into our backyard. And I probably was like three or four years old. And at that point, I just remember the, the joy and the freedom of working with dirt. So that sort of created this freedom within me to express no matter where I was something that was in a creative um, form. But what really inspires me um, at this point in my art career is working off dreams and just working with different elements in nature and art mediums and using it to create uh, a certain entity within the art form. Ever since I was a, a young girl, um, dreams have been huge in my life. My mom and grandma, we would tell stories and discuss our dreams in great depth. This time passage between where I am in the awakening stage and in the dream stage and in between has always been something that's pretty much intrigued me. So what's interesting is sometimes within the work there is this sense of timelessness. I'm pretty chaotic in my studio environments and that can be from an inside studio to an outside place of work. Uh, I get a little frantic at times because the work is going and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, oh my God, this is like terrible, what am I doing? And so the, the whole gamut of insecurity and wanting to indulge in what the work should become takes place. Um, and that's where that element of trust and sensitivity comes into what the work wishes to become. I, I love sculpture. Uh, there's a certain challenge to sculpture that I just have to do it. And I keep saying I want to downscale, but I just seem to need to have height. I love painting, but all of my paintings are becoming more three-dimensional. I guess I've, I've developed a sensitivity throughout the years in what um, I like to call it what the work likes to become and when it reveals itself to me I just have to go for it. So I never know in any given day and in any given time in my studio what it is that I'm going to be working on. I just need to follow my path. I think I'm a little bit of an alchemist. Um, so sometimes for me materials mean more to the actual imagery for example, I have collected things from hair ribbons to grandma's embroidery to my father's um, stainless steel bits in his toolbox. 
to found objects on the street from Detroit to San Francisco, and I collect these. And when I'm working on a particular piece, again, it's pretty much intuition-based. I'll, I'll come upon the, the canvas or the sculptural you know, form, and it's like, okay, what do I have that goes into it? And for me, key point is the materials. Well, this particular piece is called In Search of Shadows. The work itself is made on top of a, a sheet of uh, inch oak wood, and I used a Dremel tool to carve out the basic lines. I went into my studio and found materials, once again, that meshed with the energy or the spirit of the work, and some of those materials uh, or my Oma Anna, which was my father's mother, the garter strap thingies that connect the hose, and I think it was from the 60s or early 70s fun flowers and incredible edibles. There's a flower formation there. There's even a photograph of myself probably as a two or three year old out on a limb here. In Search of Shadows, we all have them. Um, it's sometimes good to look on the underside and there's a journey that's taking place from left to right and hopefully the viewers can enjoy some of that. And I love photography and there's a sense of chance with photography. Um, dyes drive-bys. Basically it's driving by, catching somebody or something that is of interest um, to me and shooting it and seeing what I can come up with later when I'm actually editing the photos and seeing what actually transpired during that journey. So there's a sense of time, there's a sense of chance, and there's a sense of new discovery and also sharing that part of Michigan in particular. Most of my drive-bys are of Michigan. That very purpose of taking a negative connotation of the usual drive-by shooting, which is unfortunate and dark, and bringing it into a new light of drive-by shooting where an artist or a person wishing to explore a new part of the city or landscape in the countryside and just giving something positive. Why not give it positive aspects and showing again the beauty of the people in the place. I hope that when people experience my art and where they look at it or actually go up to it, touch it, look at look at it, that they will allow themselves a moment in their life to experience a side of themselves that perhaps needs to be looked at and experienced, and that it gives them some form of self-awareness and exploration into where they are, or perhaps bringing forth a memory that is evoked through the piece, basically to experience being alive, and hopefully there's some connection with the work on that level. I hope that many of my works will find a suitable place, whether that be in somebody's home or in a public venue, so that the work can live on and continue to hopefully touch a place within a person um, so that it's a new experience. To me, it's always a mystery each time I set forth, whether it's a sculpture or a painting or, or a photograph. and just to keep following the muse and hopefully to create an audience that sort of reciprocates and gets it. To find out more about Diane Marie Kramer and all the other artists featured here today, head to DetroitPerforms.org. When photographer Amy Saka decided to move to Detroit to take 500 pictures in 500 days, she thought she'd be taking photographs of situations she's heard of in the news, images of ruin and corruption. Instead, what she found was, you can't know a street until you walk it. I decided to extend that photo essay 
to 500 pictures, and this is where I'm at now. With photography, it's a real fire. It's a, it's a definite passion in me. What I've discovered, especially in taking photos of people, it lets me see another world by connecting with another person through the camera. I get to see who they are, and I love that connection. I love not only seeing the beauty in them, but what does it bring out in me? How can I create something beautiful, but also how can I bring out something beautiful in you? I get very excited about that. For me, a lot of it is about connection. It's about connecting with other people and sharing their beauty. And again, seeing that beauty come out in me. Wow, this is me at my best when I'm so focused, I'm so into what I'm doing, I'm so into the other person that I really feel alive. And I think people need more of that in their lives. I'm not normally attracted to fire. And the fire was in the background and then there was this man and he was looking at me. It's almost like he was confronting me too. What is your role in, in, in this? What is my role in what has happened in Detroit? I think some of my best photos, portrait photos, are when we're both sort of almost invisible to each other in a way because we're, we're so into what we're doing. People can see how passionate I am about this and how interested I am in them. I think you need to be very relaxed in that circumstance to where the other person also feels like you're not taking from them, that you are. I think people can sense that. Are you trying to take something from me or are you trying to show something through me? And that is what I wanna do. If I am not at that point, I'll abandon the situation. I, what I want to do is I want to, especially if it has a person in it, I really want to honor the person. I want people to look at the photo and see the special thing in them that I saw in them. And so a lot of times I think the end result is, wow, there's something very strong and very confident about that person. And so again, it's not something that I think I set out to do. It just happens. I can't not do it. I love it that much that I, if I haven't gone out and shot pictures for a number of days, I start to feel uncomfortable. When I put this project online on my Facebook page, I started to build a lot of community around it. Suddenly, I have a group of people who are kind of holding me accountable too. I said that I'm going to do this. It's just like when you run a marathon or when you do something, you have a goal. They always say you need to have a support system around you. And that's been the beauty of the Facebook page and some of the other social media sites is that I, I suddenly have this people who care about what I'm doing. They're connecting to the city through my photos. They're sharing their own stories about Detroit on the social media site, which again adds a whole other life to my project because I have friends that I've met th through my project. I've gone back, some of the people I've taken photos of, I've gone back to visit them. One woman, I took a quiche to her house. I've taken her to a gospel service. That has been a big motivator for me, too. I feel like I sort of owe it to them, too, to, to finish the project and to say, to do what I s said I was going to do. And this is in a little bit of an obligation to the city, too. Maybe that sounds grandiose, but I feel like I'm seeing things that not everybody is seeing in going into some of these environments. And I think the world kind of deserves to, to see that slice of Detroit. I started this project only intending to take a year full of pictures. At the end of that, I thought there's way more to tell. I want to keep doing this. And so I extended it to 500 pictures. And today, I posted my 500th photo, but there's still something in me. So, dot, dot, dot.
we will see what happens next. Saka is currently working on her second phase of her 500 photos in 500 days of Detroit. Interstate Gallery is 10,000 square feet filled with two exhibition spaces, an artist residency program, a print studio, and the gallery's publishing company, One Time Run. Now, here's some upcoming events happening in and around Detroit. To discover more events in Greater Detroit, visit ICSITY.com. Eighth generation Floridian and environmental photojournalist Carlton Ward uses his talent to protect the natural habitat he loves. Take a look. I've been photographing professionally for 15 years now and from the beginning my interest in photography was always connected to conservation issues, to natural environments and the cultural legacies. From my academic studies to kind of what I do now, it's that partnership between science and art that is kind of where I try to exist. The Tampa Bay History Center is a special institution to me. The curators here are not just keyed in on history from the past, but also living history. We are a place where you can learn and engage in the history and culture of the Tampa Bay area from 12,000 years ago when people first arrived here all the way up to the present. We also have a temporary exhibit gallery where we are able to offer all kinds of different exhibits, including the Florida Wildlife Corridor Expedition exhibit, which is on display right now. We started the expedition on January 17th, 2012, in Flamingo, in the far southern part of Everglades National Park. It was actually really a relief to put the kayaks in the water and take that first paddle stroke because it had been nearly two years of intensive planning to get to that point. The Florida Wildlife Quarter Expedition team consisted of myself functioning as a photographer. Joe Guthrie is a bear biologist whose research on black bears in Central Florida was part of the inspiration for the Florida Wildlife Corridor Expedition. Mallory Likes Dimmit is a lifelong friend and fellow conservationist who is directing the Colorado Plateau Initiative for the Nature Conservancy. Elam Stolsis is a well-known PBS filmmaker. By having a filmmaker embedded in our team, it's helping us take our messages to much wider audiences than we would be able to reach just by doing photography and writing alone. The idea of a wildlife corridor is to protect linkages between existing sections of protected natural habitat. So in Florida, we have places like Everglades National Park and Ocala National Forest, big nationally significant protected areas. But if we don't protect the green spaces in between, those areas become islands separated from one another and wide ranging species like bears and panthers can't have the collective habitat they need to survive. From the mangrove coast and moving up into the sawgrass was one of the highlights of the expedition because there was a point when we kind of transitioned away from the wilderness waterway and went back country through the sawgrass of the Shark River Slough, we didn't see a person for three days. And we were just out there in this vast sea of grass that, you know, it's, it's a wilderness unlike any other in the world. 
from a photographer's standpoint, in order to bring a composition of a landscape together, I find that the clouds are really important. The clouds, as they move through, kind of provide that ephemeral moment that helps add that slice of life to the picture. One of my favorite photographs captured during the expedition is of an Ogeechee Tupelo tree. That particular photograph is very evenly lit because it's raining. I put the camera on a tripod and it was about a 10 second exposure. So the water is actually flowing by like a sheet so it disguises the raindrops. You don't really see them striking the surface of the water. I love photographing pine forest because you have so much texture and so much repetition and depth to the scene. So when we got to Ocala National Forest, I really had that kind of landscape view in mind. The wire grass was in full spring bloom, which gives it this really soft, almost white coloration and texture. A lot of the wildlife images you see in the exhibit, they were captured on camera traps. So this is an infrared trip wire that I set up across a game trail. And then as the animal walks through and breaks that beam, it takes its own picture. When we hiked through the Fakahatchee Strand, I got introduced to the ghost orchid for the first time. The ghost orchid itself is such a fragile flower that it hangs from the edge of the tree by this very thin stem that's like a long spring. And the slightest bit of wind movement or even the wing beat of a mosquito can send it dancing. They probably call it ghost orchids for other reasons, but to me the thing was so elusive and ephemeral to try to photograph it, it kind of lived up to its name. I'm approaching what are already very beautiful subjects and I don't know if I'm necessarily creating anything there, I'm just really doing my best to capture the essence of that animal or that place or that person where its already existent beauty comes through. Carlton's photography is, is really amazing and he's able to capture really the, the natural look of Florida, the colors that really say Florida, the animals the environment itself. You see the treacherous nature of Florida, whether it's a snake or an alligator, plus the, the amazing diversity of the, the fauna. He really captures that uh, like, like few others have. To the extent that we can help expand and contribute to Florida's sense of identity to include the bears and the cattle ranches and the vast connected watersheds like the Everglades and the St. Johns River, if we don't do a good job of protecting that green infrastructure, it's not just gonna be bad for the wildlife, it's gonna be bad for everyone who's trying to live here. To find out more about Carlton Ward, visit the Detroit Performs website. And that wraps it up for this edition of Detroit Performs. As always, for more arts and culture, head to DetroitPerforms.org, where you'll find featured videos, blogs, and information on the coming arts events. Also, check us out on Facebook and Twitter. We'd like to thank the Interstate Gallery for letting us come by here and explore the gallery spaces and more. Next time you're out in Eastern Market, make sure you stop in as well. Until next Tuesday, get out there and show the world how Detroit performs, y'all. I am DJ Oliver. Thanks for watching, guys. Funding for Detroit Performs is provided by the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs, MGM Grand Detroit, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.